I think it was about 1993 or 1995 that I finally looked in the mirror and I says, okay, I, I just sensed, you know, in later years there was something not right because I says, I'm a smart guy. I was, I, I, I knew I was smarter than some of my clients and they were five times wealthier than I was. So I said, there must be something wrong, something I don't know here. And so I looked in the mirror and I said, look, at either I learn business or I, I go working for someone again or I just do something else. Episode 152. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, you're missing out on the valuable, free, practice-building resources I share only via email. Getting on the list is simple. Visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the green Join Today button. I am your host, Enix Sears. To get more profit or efficiency in your firm, check out this business tip from Peter Drucker. What's measured improves. Now, I found this to be so true, and as a firm owner, you must be tracking your financial key performance indicators. One of the easiest ways to do this is with a software application like ArchiOffice. Get a live walkthrough of the software by visiting ArchiOffice.com demo, and a big thank you to ArchiOffice for supporting this show. Okay, so I have a question for you. Is it possible to be a business owner and have the lifestyle of your dreams? Most architecture firm owners fall into the trap of working all the time or never really being able to get the financial independence they want and deserve after working for so many years. Well, today's guest is co-author of the book, The E-Myth Architect. He's the founder of architectureplusbusiness.com. He's an architect and he understands the business of architecture inside and out. So I'd like to welcome today to the show, Norbert Lemmermeyer. Well, Norbert, welcome to the Business of Architecture show. Pleasure to be here. So, Norbert, let's go back in time a little bit and let's talk about, first of all, let's talk about your practice as an architect and tell me just about your, your career and your background. Well, um, when I graduated, uh, I couldn't, it couldn't get into my own business fast enough, but I had a uh, sort of previous experience as a draftsman. I worked for seven years as a draftsman and this goes back in the days before computers were in, invented or before they were used in architects' offices. So uh, I was just talking to someone the other day about the difference between then and now and what has changed. And uh, uh, computers have truly changed the way architects uh, used to do things and the way they do things now. Uh, but anyway, I was in business for... Uh, well, Norbert, I want to stop you there just for a second. In what ways have you seen the changes? Be besides the obvious, we know that the methods have changed a little bit. But in your perspective... How has that changed the practice of architecture? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, like when I had, uh, I was the master in my office, but then when I, uh, when we got into computers, it was the uh, CAD operators that became the masters in the office. So I was, I was subject to their uh, 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 expertise and wisdom. And, uh, and so consequently, it seemed like they were running the office and not me anymore. And I never ever did really sort of get very good at computer aided drafting, but also, uh, computers also just changed the nature of the business of our, uh, you know, the business aspects, the writing letters. Like before, for instance, before, um, we had computers, uh, our letters were given to our secretaries to type. After we had computers, of course, we do our own letters. I mean, that was just, it, no one would ever think of getting a secretary to uh, type, type a letter anymore. And so that changed. Filing, of course, was completely different. Uh, you could almost operate uh, an office without having any hard copy files anymore. So uh, things changed, and also things speeded up too. But it just it just felt different. It felt more business like and less kind of studio like. And uh, yeah. so I go back a long time, Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said when you graduated from school, you couldn't wait to get in your own firm fast enough. Why, why is that? Well, I don't know. Uh, I guess, uh, well, I just wanted, I guess I just wanted to do things my way. And uh, mind you, uh, once I was in business after about a year or two, then I found out that there's a lot of things I didn't know. And, and that's sort of the crux of why I'm doing what I'm doing today uh, is I'm trying to sort of help uh, upstart uh, young architects or struggling businesses 
uh, with their business uh, things. I think I know a lot of things that uh, would be of use to them and of value to them. I'm sure. Well, let's let's get into that. So, what are some of those things during the early years, and looking back, that you didn't know that you wish you did? Well, hmm, just simple uh, business techniques like how to hire someone properly, uh, standard office procedures, um, uh, marketing. Of course, I was very weak at marketing. They had no clue of what what to do about any marketing. Uh, the, like the, the man I worked for before I started my own company was a very charming and, um, how shall I say, public figure. So he, just by the sheer fact of his personality, he drew in work. Mm. My personality wasn't quite that charming, so <laughs> I had to do it the hard way. But anyway, I managed to stay in business for 35 years. Uh, uh, without going bankrupt, so I had, you know, I said develop something. But uh, in latter years, I uh, I learned a lot of uh, marketing, and I did a lot of marketing studying. And and now, of course, uh, I'm always uh, curious to learn about marketing. And thus, I'm working with your company uh, and uh, finding out some very sort of good ideas. More, I, I like I like the systematic approach that that your company teaches. And and even though I do marketing. And I'm a systems kind of person. I've never really systematized my marketing, the marketing aspects of, of what I do. And um, uh, so uh, we're, what, we're, what were we talking about? <laughs> well, that's great. So we were talking about some of the early lessons. I like you went into marketing a little bit. You know, so it sounds like you're going to be a force to be reckoned with once you systematize the marketing. Well, I, I don't want to be a force to be reckoned with, but I just want to be able to uh, – I want to be help, help – young architects with that. And I want to be able to really sort of give them something that is useful to them. Great. I have, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's, it's great to have you here on the show because this is an avenue to get your message out to a lot of these young architects and more mature architects as well to listen to the show and, and be exposed to what you're doing because you have some great experience to share, like you said. And so it's, I really look forward to seeing how Architecture Plus Business continues to grow. Well, thank you for the opportunity because this I, you know, I always look for opportunities, of course, like this to sort of be able to get the word out. Yes. So, t yes, go ahead. Anyway. Yes. Sure. So let's go back. So you graduated from school. About how long did you work at another firm? Uh, well, altogether, I worked, uh, let's say, six years before I went to school. And then during school, I worked four years and then two years afterwards. So a total of nine or ten years, I worked for another firm before I started on my own. And I only worked for one other firm. I, I didn't move around. Hmm. You know, I, I once talked to an architect uh, here where I'm at, and uh, it was back when I was I just graduated from school, and he was saying, you know what, I wish I would have worked for other architects longer, because he's been a sole practitioner for a long time, and so he says, you know, I, I wish, sometimes there's some gaps in my knowledge, or some things I wish I knew about how other architects did things, that he wishes he would have spent more time in other offices. Did you ever have, can you identify with that? Is that a, what do you think about that? Well, um... My comment on that topic would be is that uh, when you work for an architect, they teach you a lot of things. And I was very, very good. I was a good designer. I was a good technician. I was a good uh, project administrator. You know, the best, uh, the best in town, as the saying goes. The only thing I didn't know really anything, how to, anything about business. So I didn't even think about business, to tell you the truth, when I was working for the other company. And I don't think that they were necessarily interested in teaching me about business simply because of the fact that one day I would be their competitors. Mm -hmm. And in talking to a lot of other people who started their own business, that's exactly true. They, they don't learn because they have no need to learn. And they, their, their employers certainly don't make it their business to teach them because before you know it, they're competitors. And uh, the less they know about business, the better they're off. <laughs> that's, that would be my comment on that topic. Yep. So you worked, so you had about 10 years of work experience. Tell me about that leap from going to being employed for another firm and then going out on your own. What was that leap like? Tell me that story. Well, I had, I had known a lot of people associated with the architecture business in town and a lot of clients as well. So when I started my office, I started off with a lot of clients. Uh, and, you know, as times went up and down and there was recessions and that sort of thing, I sort of lost some clients. And then uh, later on, it was harder and harder to find clients. 
and also then a lot of inefficiencies, just a lot of things I didn't know about business. Uh, it's it's uh, the program that I have now, it just goes through 20 lessons step by step on how to do how to do uh, things in a certain situation. Like uh, in, let's say, in, in finances, I have uh, four lessons within finances, one on how to keep track of uh, your uh, money, uh, billing, collecting, uh, management report. Management report is the most important thing I think that an architect can have with regards to finances simply because the fact that he can make decisions based on the financial situation uh, that presents itself in an office. So uh, as we march through uh, the different, I, I guess I, I don't want to get into a sales pitch, but as we march through the different lessons, these things are learned specifically. And then not only that, but we also, uh, what I found out now is that, no, I should say this, what I, what's important about learning about the business of architecture, if you can learn it with a mentor or coach who can talk about your situation, not about some theoretical situation. And, and basically my experience then, of course, when I went into business and I knew I was short on uh, business expertise, I started looking around, I went to the university, took some courses, I, I, I read some books, but none of it's all theoretical stuff, so it's very, very difficult to apply it to directly to what you're doing. So uh, mentoring, when they use your own company as a model or as an example, I think that's the way that it's best learned if you haven't learned business uh, along with your architecture. Mm, absolutely. Well, let's let's go back and dive a little bit into that that transition point when you left your other firm and you went to your new mm -hmm. firm. What did you? Uh, were you working out of your home? Did you have an office immediately? Tell me about that transition point. Tell me the story, the characters involved, the the streets, the weather. I want to I want to get a feeling for what it was like to go through that. Well, okay, uh, I I had work right on the first day, so I opened up an office. It was a uh, and how how did you have work, Norbert? Well, I, like I said, I knew I knew I had a, I knew clients from my other company and. And they had more clients than they could use in a way. So me taking the smaller projects away from them was no big deal. In fact, my boss sort of encouraged me sometimes to take some of the projects. So yeah, uh, were you to, were you moonlighting at the time? No, no, no. Okay, no. I just went sort of cold turkey, so so to speak. But I also I had some friends in the business who I thought were good technicians and one good architect who came with me. But as employees, I started as sole pra practitioner. And so uh, we started, we had a, we found a little rundown old office building and uh, you know, this typical story about an architect fixing up a space and, and, uh, and we had a, this uh, uh, grand opening, you know, with music and wine and the whole business. And then uh, the first year was just uh, fantastic because uh, we were working long hours, but that, that didn't matter. We were young and, and full of energy and all that sort of thing. And then, uh, you know, two or three years later, uh, these long hours, you know, 10, 12, 14 hour days, they started catching up to me. And also, uh, my wife started grumbling about never coming home on time and all, you know, the standard, uh, complaints. Uh, and, and also it was just started to get tiresome. The, you know, the, the, the bloom was off the vine, so to speak. And then, of course, the recession hit and then, and then, uh, Things started going a little more badly after that. I think we had three good years before the recession hit, and then things started going downhill. But no, the first few years we were kind of the kind of the toast of the town. I got to say this: uh, in when I first came into architecture, it was kind of standard uniform in our city that everyone that went into an architect's office wore black black uh, uh, black trousers, a white shirt, and a black tie, a narrow black tie. That was standard fare. So when we started our office, we started a new trend where we all wore uh, blue jeans <laughs> wow. to the office and, and, uh, and T-shirts and that sort of thing. So that was kind of uh, – and then we, we had known quite a few artists, so we often had parties with them on Friday afternoon was always a uh, – um, Oh, a kind of wine and beer and wine party and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, mm. So that's that's how it went. It was a very much a more of a studio than an office, I would say. 
Yep. And did you take any financing during those early days? How did you pay for your initial lease and get your startup funds? Well, I had, uh, I'm, I'm a natural saver, I guess. And so with this, uh, with this on the horizon, I knew this was coming. So I'd saved, uh, I'd saved up, I think about, uh, between 30 and $40,000, which 40 years ago was a lot of money. And so I managed to sort of finance the whole thing. And we had cash flow starting the second month, we had cash flow. And so we managed to sort of take off. It was a sort of a, a fantastic start, but, uh, it sort of went downhill after that, I guess. I wouldn't say downhill, but but it was a lot easier to begin with than in later years. Well, and do you remember when the recession hit? What were the warning signs? What were some of the first things you saw as that started to change? Well, I should have. I should have. Well, what, this is the first time I'd been in business, of course, and and you think, well, this is not going to happen to me. And every generation, I guess, has to learn this. But I had an mm-hmm. office. In, in my city, which is Edmonton, and then there was another small city called Grand Prairie where I had a branch office. So the branch office completely ran out of work, and then it still didn't sort of dawn on me. I shut the office. I pulled back to Edmonton, but I still, it was business as usual. Well, about nine months later, it, it hit Edmonton, and then basically one day, I, my four biggest projects got canceled. And I had, uh, I had uh, at that time, I had 10 people employed architects and draftsmen and uh within six months i was down to myself and a part-time secretary (laughs) i had to lay everyone off but i managed to stay in business i had i found enough work to stay in business and then after that of course slowly two or three years later it started building back again and back in business and norbert how did you do you remember how you came to the decision to make that first layoff when did you know it was, you know what, I really have to lay someone off now? What was, what was that like? It was hard. Uh, I, I just, I realized, I knew I saw the money in the bank and I saw payday coming and I knew that I could make this payday, but I couldn't make the next payday. And so I just had to, I had to do something. So the first round of layoffs, we laid off, I think uh, one day we laid off four people and then uh, a couple months later, three people, and then fi- finally laid off the last person that was working for me, except my secretary, who is also my bookkeeper. She stayed on a part-time basis. That was it. That was terrible. Uh-huh. And and how long did that last, that lean operating? Well, it it, uh, it went on for, till I was back in business was, I mean, real business where I had employees working for me again, I would say... Um, five or six years before we were back up and running properly. In fact, I'll tell you what, I was in a, in, in a, in a space, this was a different space than I started in. I was in a space, so I, I finally went to my landlord and said, you know, I can't pay the rent anymore, so I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to leave. And he says, no, he says, he says, uh, if you leave, he says, I couldn't get anybody else to rent it either. So he'd given me free rent for three years, actually. Wow. Yeah, I know. So he was my patron there thereafter, and uh, even he just died recently. And I been I called on him in, in the seniors' home every year, once or twice, just to thank him again for being my patron. Mm. That's that's really nice. That that's a that's a fun story. So it was so it was a few years like that, really lean, uh, and so that must have been a pretty deep deep recession. Yeah, I was. I would say the worst. That was the worst. I would say. Uh, certainly in my time, but I think some people say it was the worst recession since the 1930s. So anyway, yep. yeah. And was that, was that the late seventies? Was that the oil? It was in 1983. In that early eighties. There you go. Yep. Early eighties. Was, there was very high interest rates and low oil price combined with low oil prices. And that's just, we're in the sort of the middle of the whole oil economy and that, that kind of impacted us. That's what caused it. Yeah. Okay. And then in what, what stage of your career did you decide, you know what, I'm going to go figure out this business stuff? Well, uh, let's just see. I'm just trying to put, uh, I think it was about 1993 or 1995 that I finally looked in the mirror and I says, okay, I, I just sensed, you know, in later years there was something not right because I says, I'm a smart guy. I was, I, I, I knew I was smarter than some of my clients and they were, five times wealthier than I was. So I said, there must be something wrong, something I don't know here. And so I looked in the mirror and I said, look, at either I learn business or I, 
I go working for someone again or I just do something else. So then I found uh, I found a mentor here at Edmonton and we worked together for a while. And I do, you know, uh, Mr. Michael E. Gerber. I know of him. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He, well, he's a, he calls himself the guru of small business. And he has a book called The E-Myth. I shouldn't be advertising, but I am. And I read that, and I really uh, took that serious. And then he also has a program called E-Myth Mastery. And so it was an 18-month program uh, where you learn the business, business like in a small business format. And uh, basically he says, and I agree with him now that I've been through all this, that all the books written – uh, are written for bigger business and there's nothing really out there or very little out there that's specifically for small business. And when I'm talking small business, I'm talking say, uh, you know, less than a million dollars in revenue and say from zero to 10 people. That's what I define as small business. And what in revenue did you say, would you estimate? I said less than a million is, is my, uh, Definition, of course. I, I some of my clients right now make over a million dollars, so I don't. Uh, uh, in fact, there's one client who makes five million dollars a year, but he still hires me to help him simply because of the fact that he never learned business properly either. It's just he's he so horrifically successful, but he realizes that he's working too hard and that he should learn something about business so he can, in fact, instruct his employees properly uh, to help him. And so, uh, but that's my definition. Yeah, so so you got a hold of that book, the Emith Architect. Or I'm sorry, the Emith um, Emith, and um, and then you took the Emith Mastery course, and then later on you ended up authoring the book Emith Architect. Yeah, I worked with, that. with Michael Gerber. I worked with him together. We worked yep, together. Yep. So how did that connection happen? Well, I took the mastery program, and then he had a seminar one time, and I wanted to go to California. So I thought, oh, I'll go to this seminar. And then we met and uh, <coughs> we talked. And um, he says, well, I got this. So he started a program where he was trying to uh, write every, the book in every profession, the E-Myth uh, lawyer, the E-Myth accountant, and I was the E-Myth architect. So I wrote the book along with him. And uh, basically I sat on the book for, uh, for about two years because I was still in my business. And then when I got out of, when I passed my business on to my employees, I decided that I'd like to get into uh, mentoring and coaching because I could see how many young architects and small businesses needed this as badly as I needed when I went into business. I also now can walk into pretty well any small business and I get a quick, pretty quick sense of how they're doing without knowing their bookkeeping or anything like that. I just get a sense how they, how they react and how they respond, how they're doing in business. And what would you say would be the, the tells, so to speak? Um, well, one of the things is, is the first thing they say, I'm so busy, I don't have time to do anything. That's the, one of the first, the first signs. Uh, the other thing is uh, I'm having a, uh, my cli- I hate my clients. I, I don't know how to handle my clients or my clients don't appreciate me. Or, or the other thing is, you know, I'm having a very difficult time hiring and keeping employees. I say those are the three biggest ones. And if you, if you, if, if you go around and actually you can try that for yourself. You just walk around in a small, uh, when you're going into a small business and just ask them about their business, see what they say. And, and you can pretty well tell, uh, that they are, I would say weak businessmen or uninformed businessmen or women. Yep. So what are the, let's talk about what you lay out in your book, uh, E-Myth, E-Myth Architect. What are some of the main points of the book in terms of running a better business? Oh boy, let's see. Well, first of all, one of the big issues with learning business, especially if you're in business, is of course it's going to take some time and time away from doing your business. So it, 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 if you approach it and saying I'm going to fix my business, like say where to start, and <clears throat> so the most important thing that I think is breaking the business down into segments 
and learning them one at a time. We call them centers of attention. Some people say six centers, some people say seven centers, but it doesn't matter. You break in the business down so you can handle one thing at a time. Say, hey, let's just say you did it over seven years and you had did, worked on one each each year. Now to an upstart businessman, seven years seems like a long time, but I was in business for 35 years, so seven years is just a very short, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a very short uh, period of my whole working career. And, and so I think a lot of things too is that some small businesses, and I try to tell uh, people when you go into changing your business, take your time. Don't try to do it all at once. And also, it says that, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's some things that you have to learn. You have to learn business just like you had to learn architecture. You know, architecture, who can learn to be an architect in six months? Who can learn to be an architect in one year? Uh, I don't think that's, that's possible. That's why it takes four or five or six years to become an architect. And so it takes uh, that kind of time to become a businessman, a proper businessman. I call what I was doing in the old days, I call it, uh, a home, homegrown business style. <laughs> home, no, homemade, homemade business style. <laughs> and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.